people of the remote northeastern peninsula of the Arnhem Land in Australia are known as the Yongu. Yongu people are the traditional owners of the Arnhem Land as they have been occupying this area for over 60,000 years. Yongu, which is a direct translation of the word human or people, but has come to mean the indigenous people of northeast Arnhem Land, are unique amongst other Australian indigenous groups because of their kinship. Divided into separate moieties or clans, the Yongu population of 12,000 people consists of an aggregation of various indigenous nations residing in Arnhem Land, and who share similarities in their ideas, customs, and social lifestyles. These clans distinguish themselves from one another based on linguistic variants, but yet still identify as being of Yongu descent. For years, the Yongu people lived a semi-nomadic lifestyle. Most clan members were hunter-gatherers, gathering foodstuff from the rich environment of the Arnhem land. In fact, depending on the seasons, Yonko people would travel from inland areas to coastal regions of the Northern Territory to trap and to benefit from the seasonal offerings available on the land. The 15th century saw the arrival of Macassan fishermen who traveled from Indonesia to the northern coast of Australia to collect sea creatures. The Macassans developed working relationships with the Yonko people, which allowed for trade agreements to be established. In fact, Macassans were granted fishing rights and showed their gratitude to the Yongu people by trading fabrics, medicines, metals and weapons, rice and seeds. Trade was not an unknown practice for the Yongu, as various clans within the tribe engaged in trade with each other, predominantly trading food and sacred medicines. Therefore, the Macassans perceived the Yongu people as a fair and organized society. Several aspects of contact with the Macassans can still be discerned in today's Yongu culture within their language, in their ceremonies, and in their oral history. However, the 19th century proved to be detrimental to the existence of the Yongu people, as European colonists swept through the Northern Territory seeking land and livestock acquisition opportunities, and thereby restricting land access to the Yongu people. Although Yongu people resisted, they were met with brutal counterattacks. Colonialists would come to shape the modern world with colonial system of laws, politics, and economy, which would restrict the Yongu's people's ability to occupy the land and to practice their rituals as they did before contact. There was a time when the world was a silent, dark place and held the souls of all living things that would later materialize. Below the Earth's crust, lived powerful ancestor spirits who emerged from beneath the land and gave life to all animate and inanimate things on earth. This is said to have occurred during the dream time. Dream time, originally known as Wangar, is considered to be the foundational principles of the Australian indigenous creation, which is shared and understood amongst various Yongu clans within the kinship system. Despite minor variations in the interpretation of creation stories amongst clan, by virtue of regional differences and historical experiences, dream time is an important aspect of Yongu culture, as it is not only a belief system that explains the actions by which ancestral beings shape the land, but also provides indigenous peoples with a body of moral, jural, and social rules, which acts as a mechanism of social control. Thus, dream time is not a belief system that is anchored in antiquity. Instead, it is a dynamic concept which continues to define many aspects of indigenous life today. Dreamtime is first and foremost a narrative that accounts for all Yongu ancestors as those responsible for creating the spiritual, human, and physical world. In fact, these spirits are acknowledged as being the creators of indigenous people, the rocks, mountains, rivers, creeks, waterholes, plants, and animals. It is said that Yongu ancestors simultaneously transform themselves into the sacred objects that exist in their environment. These elements of creation are very much inscribed in the Jangable Sisters creation story, which saw the journey of three siblings travel through the land on a bark canoe with their dilly bags full of sacred emblems. They spread those items throughout the land, which gave life to humanity and continues in the present day. As such, it is believed that Yongu spirits are still very much present in the daily life of the people because the ancestors did not disappear at the end of the dreaming, but remain in these sacred sites linking the past and the present. Since mythology is an essential component of Yongu culture, creation stories have been preserved for many generations by Yongu elders through art and ceremony. 
Art is described as one of the only effective methods to accurately transmit dreamtime knowledge and ideas to future generations. Since today's Yonggu people were not present when the creation events happened, dreamtime ceremonies and art each have individual purposes in the prosperity of dreamtime stories for future generations. First, ceremonies are used by Yonggu people to engage with the ancestral spirits. These events allow for clan members to conceptualize the spirits who created the world. Art is subsequently used as a method to communicate the perceived image of dreamtime spirits, those of whom continue to provide Yonggu people with all elements of life that allow them to exist on Earth. Dreamtime art and ceremonies often provide historical evidence of contact which have, in some instances, altered creation stories from their original interpretation. In fact, some representations of creation stories through ceremony shows evidence of colonization with the Macassans by depicting the important role that cloth has in the role of boats, in spiritual journeys, and in occasional references to Allah. Dreamtime not only serves as a belief system representing the mythical ancestral beings who created the world, plants, animals, and people, but is a central component of Yonggu way of life by providing a set of customary laws in which Yonggu people must abide. The set of laws established within the Dreamtime stories is commonly referred to by various Yonggu clans as the Nagara Laws. Nagara Law is a unique set of laws which prescribes rules and regulations to various elements of Yonggu culture, such as marriage, land claims, land use, language preservation, conservation of sacred objects, and other culture-specific laws that must be respected. For example, in the context of respectful land use, Nagara Law states that in the Dreamtime, Baru, a mythical totem crocodile, created places and gave them law. He granted law to all things including fish, fresh and salt water, plants, peoples, and animals. Baru's objective is said to have put all things under one umbrella, the Nagara umbrella. This belief system teaches Yonggu people how much land they can use and how they must respect it. As all actions are considered reciprocal, for example, Respecting fresh water will mean that Yonggu people will continue to have access to the clean and potable water for generations to come. Today's Dreamtime interpretations continue to be an important element in Yonggu people's lives. Dreamtime serves as a mechanism to allow Yonggu culture to flourish despite government schemes which seek control over these fiercely autonomous groups. In fact, for years, the Australian government has attempted to disrupt Yonggu rituals by implementing legislations that are representative of Australian laws. Creation stories provide Yonggu people with space for reflection to reconnect with their ancestral roots in order to revitalize their culture and to ensure that it will continue to thrive for generations to come. The Yonggu have a complex social structure and are connected by an intricate kinship system which is called the Gurutu. The people are divided into two moieties which are called the Dua and the Yurjita. Genealogy determines a person's moiety, and everything in the land is either Dua or Yujita. Few people do not have a moiety, and they are called the Wakinju. From these two moieties, the people are further divided into clans. This diagram shows how the Yonggu social structure is divided. There are more than 50 Yonggu clans in total, and each have their own lands or country, which they call the Wagna, languages philosophies, totems, and song lines, or ceremonies, which they call Bungul. This table shows some of the clans in the two moieties as well as the homeland of that clan. Clan membership is patrilineal, meaning the individual belongs to the moiety and clan of their father. Their mother belongs to the opposite moiety. Therefore, if a man or woman is Duwa, their mother will be Yerjita. Clan members are also separated into their specific roles, such as headmen, elders, etc. Kinship structures and practices are common to all Yonggu clans. The Yonggu clans practice exogamy, meaning to the two moieties intermarry and a Yonggu member must marry someone from the opposite moiety. In their marriage system, the families usually arrange the marriage. Ideally, a mother's mother's brother, Amari, bestows his own daughter as a mother-in-law, Mukul Rumaru, to his sister's daughter's son, the Gutara. Thus, a man marries an actual or classificatory matrilateral cross-cousin, his mother's mother's brother's daughter's daughter, a Galay, who may also be his actual mother's brother's daughter. Polygonous marriages are considered desirable, meaning a man will take on multiple wives who are often sisters. 
the domestic units are very close, and a man, his wife or wives, and their children all live in the same household. Brothers with their wives and children also tend to live in proximity to each other. The women usually forage together, while the men tend to hunt with each other. Another aspect of the Yongu social structure is avoidance relationships. Avoidance relationships are where people don't speak with or directly look at one another and avoid being near each other. Although they avoid each other, there is still respect in the relationship. The most common avoidance relationships in the Yongu clans are son-in-law and mother-in-law and brother and sister avoidance. The brother-sister avoidance usually begins after initiation and is called Mariri. The children in the Yongyu are treated very well. Children are not punished or physically threatened by adults, and young children and infants are never overtly denied what they want. The infants are almost always in physical contact with their caretakers. From this, you can see that the Yongyu are a very social group that value respect and caring for others. While substantial information on social structures and religious beliefs is available concerning the Yongyu, the same cannot be said for pre-contact relationships with neighboring nations. Despite this information being missing, one important and fascinating relationship that has been explored and researched in depth is that of the Yongyu people and the Makassans, a relationship based on trade and a sharing of knowledge and innovation. The Makassans, a group from eastern Indonesia known today as Sulawesi, were the first outsider group to make contact with the Yongyu in the northeastern part of Australia, Arnhem Territory. What was first a relationship comprised of curiosity and weariness, soon came to be known as a relationship of allyship and trade. What's important to know about this relationship is who the Makassans were. This group of Indonesian travelers were fishermen, also known as Trepangers. The name Trepangers emanated from what they were fishing, Trepang or sea cucumber. These fishermen began making annual trips to northern Australia around 1400. The Macassans would sail to Australia around December at peak harvest times and would return to Sulawesi in April. For the Yongyu people, the Macassans were the first outsiders they had ever encountered. This group of fishermen, who sailed south each year beginning circa 1400, would soon become a prime influencer on Yongyu culture and way of life. M. H. Munro writes in his article concerning the Macassan traders that the Macassan contact with the aboriginals of the north had a profound effect on their cultures. The visits are still remembered through oral history, songs and dances, and paintings on rock and bark. The effects that the Macassans had on the Yongnyu culture were integral to their way of life and economic lifestyle. In Macassan History and Heritage, Editors Clark and May describe the ways in which Macassan contact influenced the way in which the Yolnu began to live following contact. The relationship, they explained, led to the transfer of knowledge and of technologies not previously known to the indigenous group. Some of these items that the editors list are canoes, sails, hooks, fishing lines, beads, and metals. Apart from these materialistic components, which would propel the Yolnu into a modern fishing age, Cultural impacts were also deeply felt among the indigenous group, in not in a colonialist way that the Europeans would later introduce. In the same book, Clark and May write that culture was spread through an understanding and sharing of the Malay language in, of which the Macassans people spoke. Language was a large part of the cultural sharing. Christian Pereira writes in his piece Campbell C. McKnight, The Voyage to Mirage, that the Macassans left behind a linguistic component of which the Yongnyu adopted, such as oral, written, and artistic literature, in a comprehensive yet not extensive understanding of Malay vocabulary. Furthermore, culture was spread through the Macassans and to the Yongnyu people through methods of trade, traditional law, and the exchange of labor. However, another interesting component was also part of this transfer of culture. Pereira writes that while the basis of Yongnyu society was mainly left unchanged and uninterrupted, there were temporary unions with indigenous women bringing to the world Métis children. Here we see the small yet noteworthy mixing of the Macassans and Yolnu people through unions demonstrating that while culture was intermingling through trade and labor, it was also being diffused through people and relationships. A question that is constantly raised in this field of research is why were the Macassan fishermen continuously welcomed back to the Arnhem lands? The Macassan fishermen were continuously welcomed to the Yolnu lands 
because they were respectful and non-invasive into the communities and lands of the Yolnu. There are accounts of the fishermen remaining only camping on the beaches of the Arnhem lands and purposely avoiding the Yolnu woman. The Macassan respected the land as Yolnu land, and this was understood. In concluding this section, we leave you with an expert from M. H. Monroe who recounts the story told by Gumacht clan from Yurkla, a Yolnu tribe, concerning the first contact with the Macassans. According to the story, the first the Aboriginal people knew of the Macassans was when they saw two prows approaching Port Bradshaw. Most of the people scattered further inland, while some stayed to watch these strange things from the thick vegetation. Two young boys had not heard about the prows and were fishing with spears in the mangrove swamps. The prows anchored at Denea in a tidal creek at which point two young Macassan boys left the prow to collect shellfish. The Aboriginal boys heard the Macassans and crept closer, watching the Macassans. The Macassan boys eventually saw them and both group watched each other for a while before they all began talking. The Macassans gestured that the Aboriginal boys should go with them to visit their father. At the Macassan camp, the men were divided into two groups, dancing and singing, which they apparently did before they began collecting trepang. The Aboriginals thought it was like the moieties of their people. The Aboriginals hid behind a tree while the Macassan boys told their father, and he and another man came and grabbed the boys, taking them back to the camp. They were eventually given food and taught to smoke a Malay pipe, and then allowed to return to their own camp. When they told their people about the Macassans, many others went and made camp near the Macassan camp. According to the story, the father of the two boys was named Dainaisi, and the name of the captains of the prows were Garumala and Wunanji. In analyzing the Yongu people and their pre-contact history, it is easy to observe a civilization built on a deep connectedness to land, spirituality, and relationships. The indigenous group of the Arnhem land built a civilization that was strong, had peaceful connections with outsider groups with whom they built an economic trade route and alliance. They built a civilization that resembles most indigenous civilizations across the world pre-contact. Those are civilizations of peace, cooperation, and fundamental respect for everything around them. When one analyzes and reads about the Yongu people, it is easy to see these resemblances amongst indigenous nations across the world, especially those of Turtle Island, also known as North America. When compared, the two sets of diverse indigenous civilizations shared much of the same concepts of life, respect, cooperation, and peace. It is those concepts which make it all harder to read about their destruction upon European colonization and invasion. What were once flourishing communities and nations crumbled and fell due to a new system of beliefs thrust upon them. A system of oppression, greed, and racial superiority. What we need to remember about the Yongu people is that who they were pre-contact is still who they are today. A nation of respect, cooperation, and peace. Traits that civilization today should learn from and build on. The pre-contact history of the Australian Yongu people reveals a civilization founded on a unique set of spiritual principles passed down from their ancestors. These teachings were transferred from generation to generation, which allowed Yongu people to maintain intricate political and economic systems which were reflective of their traditions and beliefs. As a result, Yonkul people were perceived as a respected ally by the Macassans because of their ability to be a self-sufficient and sustainable community. Despite many years of tyranny, exploitation, and oppression by European settlers in Australia, Yonkul people have survived and are more intact than any other Aboriginal communities who have lost their connection to the land through historical dispossession. Yonkul people remain the occupants of the beautiful Arnhem land territory and continue to perform their traditional and customary practices by virtue of their cultural and social norms, which stem from the dream time. Dream time allows all members of the complex Yongu social structure to connect with their ancestors, a process that has safeguarded their cultural heritage under all circumstances, no matter how difficult. <laughs>